for you a few verses, then we'll have prayer, review, and then I'll preach to you for a few moments here today from Philippians chapter 4. Look with me, would you please, beginning in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Notice verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll spend some time here together in Philippians chapter 4. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, again for this place that you've provided, Lord, for your people who've gathered. Thank you, Lord, for the good music that I believe has glorified you And, Lord, we're honored today to be able to speak of you and to speak from your word. We'd ask today that you would help us to have ears that are open and hearts that would uh, be all bowed before you, Lord, and that we would listen to what you'd have for us, Lord, that it might help us. Lord, if there's one today that's not saved, Lord, we desire that today they would know you in salvation. Lord, if there's one today who is away, Lord, that they might be drawn to you, that they might see your long suffering and your patience. And then, Lord, we would ask that you would establish us further in your word and in truth. Lord, there's tremendous power here in this portion of Scripture that we'll consider coming firsthand through the testimony of the Apostle Paul and what he had learned. Lord, help us today to learn as well. And we we'll certainly thank you, Lord, for all that you'll do here in our midst. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been in the book of Philippians now for several weeks, and just very quickly, and we'll review this evening and conclude the book of Philippians tonight, but the letter written to the church in Philippi, written by the Apostle Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the church in Philippi is distinct in that it was the first church founded by Paul in Europe. You'll remember that the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16 had a vision from a man who said, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after the Lord had closed the door, On Paul staying in Asia Minor, he traveled into Europe, and he would go into a large city, the city of Philippi, known for gold mines and known for fresh water, a city right on a major highway, a city that had a great history. There have been many battles fought there. People wanted that place. They wanted that position to be able to hold. There was a port not too far away from that, and we touched on the fact that Roman soldiers had uh, developed that in a sense where it had become underneath the citizenship of Rome, and the people there took great pride in that. And there was some instruction there about their citizenship being that of citizens of heaven and that they were to behave that way. Evidently, there were several things that the Lord wanted Paul to address in this letter. One was simply to thank these folks. And we read about that again in verse 10 this morning. Thank them for their offerings. Also to remind them that they were to get along. There were some folks fussing. There was some false teaching that was coming in. And we dealt with that in chapter 3. And then also he wanted them to know what had become of their servant, a man from their church by the name of Ephroditus, and how he had come and brought the gift to the apostle Paul. We've looked at particular themes throughout this book. We've seen where the Apostle Paul was used by the Lord to tell us in chapter 1 that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And yet Paul said that he would remain with them because that was more needful and he desired that in his life or his death that Christ be magnified. In Philippians chapter 2, there was the, the model in ministry given, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And the Bible would go on to tell us that he took upon him the form of a servant and was obedient to God, even unto the death of the cross. And that was imparted to them that they should too have the same mind that Christ had, that they should serve one another, that there should be a desire to help one another. And then in chapter 3, the instructions regarding the law and those that sought to bring them under the law. And then the apostle Paul would give his own history and basically would state that if anybody should find their standing with God based on who they are, what they know, and what they've done, it would be the apostle Paul himself because there was nobody like him, nobody that had that the pedigree, so to speak. But the apostle Paul said that once he found Christ, he found that all those things were nothing and meant nothing 
They desired that he would know Christ in a greater way, and that he would experience the power of the resurrection, and that he would be a, have the fellowship of Christ's sufferings as well. And he spoke of that personal drive that he had to press toward the mark, and he would go so far as to say that he wanted to apprehend that which he had been apprehended of. And then later the Lord would have him to say that he had not yet apprehended. And then in Philippians chapter 4, there's an entire passage given here, the first nine verses that deal with uh, unity and peace amongst ourselves, and then also peace in ourselves. The Bible says that the Lord wanted to give them peace, the sort of peace that would protect their hearts and their minds. And we talked about the peace of God that man has, according to the book of Romans. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have peace with God. We talked about how before Christ we were at war with God, but now in Christ we are brought nigh to him. We have a mediator in Jesus Christ. And that peaceful position that we have in Christ should reign in our lives. It should reign in our relationships. It should reign in our service. And we should be a people described as being peace or at peace or tranquil. That doesn't mean that we won't have storms. It doesn't mean that we won't have problems. It doesn't mean that we won't experience difficulty. But it does mean that from a seated position in our life, the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus, guides and directs us and takes our hearts and our minds and bring them, brings them into the captivity of that peace that only he can bring and if this morning you do not know Christ and you do not have peace with God there's no work there's no sacrifice there's no group that you can join there's no action that you can commit Jesus has done it all it is for you to see yourself as a sinner and recognize that as sinners we need a Savior and the only one who can save us Jesus the way the truth and the life and by faith to come to him and I'm thankful that in my life the Lord's been so gracious and good that I heard that message and I saw my need for Christ and I turned to Christ as many of you have and we're at peace with God. And now from that, the Lord wants to develop peace in our life. One of the things that we can do or the practice of peace is to have a good thought life. We emphasized that a couple Sunday nights ago. Finally, brethren, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's a list that, that describes two things to me. First of all, it describes a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus is all of those things. There's not a bad angle on Jesus Christ. There's not a thing about Christ that you will see that you will find to be unjust or dishonest or untruthful. Hence, our thoughts should be on Jesus. This is why the Lord would use the Apostle Paul to tell us as we're running the race, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Also, this is a description of the Word of God. The majority of our life is to be spent with a focus and an attention on our Savior and also a focus and an attention on His Word because His Word is truth. His Word is honest. His Word is lovely. And so in this life, our thought life is so important. What comes in here affects this right here. And so I need to be careful. And we're bombarded in our life. We're bombarded with voices. We're bombarded with thoughts and themes and directives and directions from the world, the, the world, the flesh, and the enemy, Satan himself, trying to get those voices and those statements to us. And that's why we need the Word of God. And we've got to get in God's Word. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we're looking into a glass and that looking into that glass there comes a change in our life. And that glass is the Word of God. That reference to glass is mirror when you get into God's Word and you look at God's Word, you see yourself for who you are. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides us under. It cuts us. It opens up in our heart. It shows us the things about ourselves, who we are, and the things that need to be corrected. The Word of God also reveals to us Christ. We see Jesus. And oh, how we need to see him because it is the mark that the Apostle Paul was speaking of that he was pressing toward, Christ's likeness to be like Jesus. Less of me and more of him. Christ likeness in our home. Christ likeness in our relationship. Christ likeness in our ministry and in our service. Christ likeness in the development and the working with our young people to be like him. To understand what that means and to go to his word to see that. And then we come now to verse 10. There's a transition here in Philippians chapter 4, and there's, a, there's a, an expression of gratitude. We said that one of the four reasons this book was written to thank the people, and we'll come back to that this verse this evening, and we'll notice some principles in giving and being gracious and generosity. But I want to take you now to verse 11 for time's sake. 
The Bible says, not that I speak in respect of what? The church in Philippi had sent to Paul through their servant, Ephroditus, a gift. And Paul was thanking them for that gift. But he wanted to clarify something with them, and he wasn't being arrogant, and he wasn't being rude at all. He was just being transparent with them. And he was suggesting to them that whether they had sent the gift or not, he was okay. That their gift did not establish him or establish his circumstances, but rather the Lord did that. And that's a tremendous truth. So oftentimes in our life, we, our contentment, if you will, or our satisfaction is based on our expectation of others. And when people do not measure up or meet our expectations, we become disappointed. We have an expectation of what people should do for us. I think that one of the spirits that it's work, is at work in this generation today is the spirit of entitlement. Amen. That there are people who expect that people should do for them and have to do for them rather than serving and looking to meet the needs of other people. The Apostle Paul said, whether you had sent this gift or not, I, I'm not communicating and did not communicate to you from a position of want. Not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, I'm good because Christ has made me good and because Christ is good. But let me just maybe go off a little bit here on this and give some explanation. We're a generation, I'm afraid, that lives in the place of want. Now, there's two words that are going to be used in this passage. There's going to be the word want used, and there's going to be the word need used. Everybody has needs. Everybody needs to eat. Some of us need to eat more than others. Huh? Everybody needs water. Everybody needs shelter. We need clothing. These are things that the Lord provides. These are things that he's promised to give to us, our needs. Uh, those are needs. There's another thing, though, and that's want. Want. There's a word and there's a theme that's going to be introduced here about contentment in this passage. Need, want, and contentment. Wanting and being driven by wanting is a miserable place to be. Always wanting. Wanting the next thing. Wanting the next toy when you're a child. Wanting the next house when you're an adult. Wanting the next car. Wanting the next clothing. That's not to say that we shouldn't have certain things in life. I mean, it's, it's a part of life that you would have a home, that you would have clothing, that you would have a car. Some folks take it the other extreme, and they're never happy with what God does for them, and that's touched on in this passage. If God's blessed you, then appreciate that and enjoy that and be glad for that, but recognize that it's God that has done that. I'm talking about those, uh, the Bible would describe it in another portion of Scripture, those that would be rich. Those who are purposed in their life and have given their life to having and to getting those things that they want. When you live for wants, you will always want something else. Your eyes, and it drives man and it drives the flesh of man to get bigger and to get better. From generations here in our culture, we are driven by what? Bigger, better, nicer, more expensive. I'm afraid at times we measure our status by what we have and by what, we've, what we collect in this life that we live. The Apostle Paul said, I appreciate your gift and I'm thankful. And he'll, I want you to know that I'm thankful, but I want you to know that I'm settled in my heart that whatever God gives me is fine. I do not speak from a position of want. I'm cared for. What is it today that perhaps in your heart, and by the way, this is what drives covetousness. This is what pushes us. This is why we become dissatisfied. There's a couple of things here about want. Let me just hit these very quickly with you this morning. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, so it's just a little understanding of contentment, but in this business of want and being consumed by that. And we as God's people we touched on it in our Sunday school class this morning. We as God's people are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're to have a different outlook. We're to see things clearly. We're to have a good understanding of what it's all about. We see here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Listen to this principle that's given to us in the Scripture. For we brought nothing into this world. This morning... We all entered the world the same way. You may have entered in a different location than I did, but we all entered into the world the same way. We have the commonality of that. You may have been born in an elaborate hospital. You may have been born in a farmhouse. You may have been born 
in the taxi on the way rushing to the hospital. I don't know where you were born, but we all came into the world the same way. I didn't come into this world with this suit on, with these shoes on. I didn't come into this world with a suitcase and a briefcase in my hand, and my mother's happy about that. Amen? We all came in the same way. And if you'll pardon the expression, I think it's a southern term, but pardon the crudeness, we all came in naked as a jaybird. Now, I've not seen a jaybird, and I don't know what that's all about. Look it up and let me know. But I, I remember hearing that as a child, right? That's how you entered. Matter of fact, you also entered in needing somebody to do something for you. You needed somebody to cut you and to remove you from the care that had come, from the nourishment that had come from your mother's womb. Your mother's womb. Your mother's womb. That's, how, that's God's process of life, right? And you came in and you had that birth all over you. And that special, for lack of a better expression, I know there's medical terms, that lotion that God provided to help you with your eyes and all that sort of stuff while God was forming you in your mother's womb. And you came out and you needed somebody to wipe you off. You needed somebody to cut you loose. And you needed somebody to feed you. You needed somebody to care for you. You had nothing. You didn't know your name. You didn't know a thing about a thing. That's how you entered in. You didn't come in. Now, you've heard before folks have said that person was born with a golden spoon in their mouth. Do you know that there has never been a child born with a golden spoon in their mouth? That literally did not happen. I heard that expression for the first time, and I thought, had the spoon? I don't understand, you know. You might have been born into a household of wealth. You might have been born into poverty, but we all entered in the same way. The Bible says also this, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. When in this world, in this life, you pass and you make that move from here in our presence to the presence of the Lord, you're not taking your briefcase, you're not taking your car keys, you're not taking your wealth, your title, your degrees. They're not going with you. You got one plea, Jesus. That's it. They say, preacher, why does that matter? That matters so we shape our perspective about what we're doing with our life. From the time that I'm born with nothing until the time I step out of this life and take nothing with me, then what am I living for? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my existence? Is it to get what I want? Because the world has taught me and programmed me that I should get what I want. That's what happy living is. Get what you want. Take what you want from others. Take what you want from others in relationship. Do what you want when you want because that's what it's all about. The world teaches and yet God says, listen, hold on. To really live is to bring glory to me. To really live is to understand my purpose for you and to walk in that purpose. That's really living. And yet how often do people live in what I call the valley of want? You find yourself increasingly dissatisfied. You're quick to start slow to finish, quickly loving people, and then finding yourself disillusioned with them. Because your expectation is about you and what you want out of the relationship rather than what God has for you and what God would want for your relationship. It's continually cycles back to self. Young people today, one of the easiest things to do when you're a young person is to live in that place of self, what I want. What, what can my parents do for me? What can those around me do? And then when they can't do, maybe they can't keep up with other people. Maybe they don't have the means that others do. Or maybe they want to bring you up a different way than the world. Then we begin to get rebellious and furiated and frustrated because, hey, you're not doing what I want. And I've pastored people long enough now that they'll know that there are some folks that are just as fine as can be until you cross them. Everything's fine. Until you have to say, I'm sorry, I know what you want, but that is not the direction that we need to go in, and here's why. And that doesn't mean that we should be pompous or that we should be pig-headed or we should be rude. The Bible tells us that we're to have the mind of Christ, that we're to look on others' needs rather than our own. But there comes those times in life where you don't get what you want. When I was a little boy, you know what I wanted? I wanted to eat ice cream for every meal. And now that I'm an adult, I did for quite some time eat ice cream any time that I wanted. And then I had to say, whoa, I can't keep up with the suits. Value City went out of business. Remember Value City, the good old days? Two suits for 100 bucks. Wow. That helps in building programs. You can go and get more suits, you know. You can't have everything you want. Hey, people who live their life satisfying their flesh and getting what they want, according to the Scripture... They find themselves, but they that will be rich 
fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. If I could just put this together with that. When men live and are passionate and driven by what they want, and they would go and get everything that they want, they find themselves in foolish situations. They find themselves in needless temptations and snares because they're living for want rather than living for what the Lord has for me. Not that I speak, verse 11, in respect of want, for I have, notice these next few words, for I have what? I have learned. See, the natural man says, I live for what? Here's, hey, make your list. What do you want for your birthday? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want to do? What, what, what do you want to wear? Now look, God created us, obviously, where there would be wants. And we have a great God who gives us some of our wants, doesn't he? He's good that way. But when you live for the want, then you do not rejoice in God meeting your need. You see, there are people today, you miss out on the fact that God has given you health today. That God has given you provision today. That God has given you people in your life that love you. That God has given you salvation today. All those needs filled, but you're unhappy. And you're frustrated because you didn't get what you wanted and you overlook all the need that God has filled and all the things that God has cared for. Because I don't look the way that I want to look. I don't drive what I want to drive. I don't get to wear what I want. My body is not shaped the way that I want it to be. My friends are not the ones that I want them to be. The Apostle Paul said, not that I speak in respect of one, for I have what? Learned. It is a learning to move from want, 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 to I'm content that the Lord has given me what I need. Why is it a learning thing? Because it doesn't come natural. The natural man doesn't get that. The natural man doesn't understand, hey, man, you got food and raiment, there would be content. Hey, kid, you got clothes on your back, you got a roof over your head, be quiet. Say that to your child on their birthday. Happy birthday to you, you little brat. What do you want, a cake? You want balloons? You want a party or something? You got a roof over your head. You got food in your belly and clothes on your back. Be happy. Now, in principle, those are things that should be considered. Right? I didn't get what I wanted. Well, hold on a second. You got something better. You got what you need. You've got these things. Learn to be content with that. Learn to find your satisfaction in that. Well, can we just collectively here before I move on, can we just say collectively that the Lord's been good to us? Whether you get what you want, well, I just didn't, my life just didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to. It's just not what I want. It's not how I expect. Hold on a second here. Look at what you got. Look at what the Lord's done. Rejoice in that. Look at the provision that he's provided. That's why the Bible says that godliness with contentment is great. Hold on a second. Hear those words. Need, want, contentment, great what? Gain. When you have something, you've gained that. When you have knowledge, when somebody teaches you something, you've gained something there from that experience. You've gained that. You've got that. Now, that has value. And what God gives you in life and what God teaches you in life is a gain and it's to be viewed that way in the lens of this is a great gain this is something worth having wisdom godly wisdom is more precious than rubies it's better than finding a gold mine or getting your own oil well to know the word of god and to know the riches of god's wisdom to know how to live and what living is all about not that i speak in respect of want for i have learned it's not natural it comes through learning and through a process you know the bible tells us in hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 that jesus himself learned obedience through the experience of suffering i mean it doesn't mean that jesus was lacking it it doesn't mean he was devoid of that it just says that in christ who was all god and all man who came here to be a high priest who could be touched by us and would be able to minister to us would be able to secure us and all that we went through the process of life mankind dealing with that there were things that he learned that would be useful in his ministry to us. This is what the Bible teaches. And I'm not suggesting he was lacking. But the Lord wants you to know that through his experience, he, he, he grew, he learned. 
Hold on a second. Are you growing? Are you learning? Are you still with the same person with the same wants and the same expectations that nobody, that your husband cannot fulfill your expectations? Your wife cannot fulfill your expectations. He can't buy you enough. She can't do enough for you. And so you go from one unresolved issue to the next. And that poor guy or that poor gal says, if I do this, if I get this, if I buy that, there's some of you as max that as you can be on your finances because you're trying to fill a void. You're trying to do something to, to appease the other person only to find out it won't work. There are people whose marriages have ended because they've tried to keep up. They've tried to get that one thing taken care of. Are you learning? Are you getting past that? Do you look over your life? Now, hopefully by the time you, you've entered in with nothing and you step out with nothing, I sure hope by the time you're coming to that, you'll really be able to realize what mattered. What mattered most. What mattered most were the things that were done for the Lord. What mattered most were the relationships that God gave you in life where you could be an influence in the lives of others. As Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, he said, you're my joy and my crown. You're what matters. You know, you can get ahead of things. You can get ahead of the curve, young people, if you'll start living this way now. You can get past all that want stuff and being driven by wants. Well, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do with my life. What can I do that will make the most money? What can I do that will get me the most toys? How about this? Lay down your life for Christ. That doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a preacher. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll be in ministry. But when we lay our life down, then we pick up whatever it is in life that the Lord would really have for us to do. And I'm able to say that I'm not living, and I'm not motivated by want or by being rich or attaining what the world has. I want to do and be who Jesus wants me to be. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. I have learned what? Whatsoever state I am. Therewith to be content. That suggestion of a state is, doesn't mean that if you move from Indiana to here or there, that's pretty funny. Though I have known folks who move from place to place looking for something. Well, if I change my circumstances, I'll, I'll find contentment. If I change my house, I'll find contentment. If I change the people I live with, I'll find contentment. If I live somewhere different, I'll find contentment. If I have this, no, the Apostle Paul said, I've learned something. I've learned that whatever state I am in, therewith to be content. The word content is an interesting word. It speaks, this particular usage of the word content speaks of being independent of external circumstances. It means to be sufficient for oneself, contented with one's lot. The Apostle Paul is saying to these folks, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not in a position of want, and I'm not in that spot, no matter what I'm going through, I want you to know, church, that Jesus is enough. And I've learned whatever state I'm in, whatever it is, therewith to be content. Now, I would remind you that he expressed his life being in Philippians chapter 1, that everything that had happened to him, he reminded them that it all happened for the furtherance of the gospel. It's like a train getting on a track. When I was a boy, occasionally we would ride a train to go on a trip, and that was a good time. Well, you get on that train, and you get on that track, and that track's taking you to a direction. That train's got to have a source of power to run on, and that train's moving down the track. The Apostle Paul, he got saved on the road to Damascus, and he got on the track. One of the first things that he said after he found out who it was that was calling him the Lord, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He got on the track. He was pressing toward the mark, right? And he said, I've learned as I'm on this track, as I'm pressing toward the mark, as I'm seeking that my life, whether it be in life or in death, as I'm seeking that it would glorify, that it would exalt Christ, as I'm on this track, as I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as I'm looking to him, as I'm on this track, I've come to this conclusion that whatever the Lord has for me is exactly what I need. Beaten, shipwrecked, robbed, forgotten, pressured, a load of pressure. All these things were the testimony given to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28 of the Apostle Paul. All the things that he endured that he would record, and then those things that go unrecorded. Paul said, no matter what state I'm in, I'm content. 
I know how to abound. I know how to be abased. I know how to be humbled. I know how to be victorious. I know how when I'm abased not to give up and not to quit, but to look to Jesus. I know when I'm abounding how to give God the glory and to give God the credit and not begin to be pride and fall into the trap of self. I know how to be full and give God the glory. When God does something good in your life, there's some folks when God does something good in your life, you don't rejoice in it, you don't appreciate it, you think maybe you don't deserve it, you're not worthy of it. But when God chooses to bless you or to do something in your life and you know that it's from God, be full and be thankful. And then when you're empty and you're hungry, also, this is what the Lord has for me. You see, the Apostle Paul had learned he had learned according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Hold on a second. What was one of the heart's desires that was given to us through the Apostle Paul that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may experience the fellowship of his what? Sufferings. What Paul wanted, the Lord gave to him, and the Lord taught him that in his infirmities that God's grace was sufficient, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The apostle Paul said, whatever it is, if I'm broken, if I'm beaten, if I'm forsaken, if I'm rich, if I'm full, if I'm abounding, if I've gone to a church and I've preached and they're rejoicing in the Lord and there's good fellowship and they're going forward, I'm full and I'm abounding and I thank God for that. If I'm someplace where they've run me out of town and they've stoned me and left me for dead or they've lied about me, I'm okay with that. I've learned that in all these things, God's grace is sufficient. So here is a man, and I've got to close. Here's a veteran of ministry who sits now in bonds, chained perhaps, soldiers surrounding him, locked into a room, unable to travel as he once did, a man whose body is scarred, a man whose back has been beaten hundreds of times, whose feet have been worked on through some of the persecution that he endured, whose body has been wrecked and havoc by being stoned and by being imprisoned. Here's a man whose life, some might walk by and say, that's an interesting situation that he would end up spending his life, the rest of his life in jail. How can you in Acts chapter 16 in that same city where he was thrown into the inner cell at midnight after he'd been beaten, he prayed and sang praises to God. How can you do that, Paul? What'd you learn, Paul? What is it that you know that I don't know? What do I need? I've learned whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. Contentment comes from right expectation of life and a consideration that I'm on the right track and whatever comes my way, whatever I have, whatever I lack, this is what God wants me to have and this is what God has for me and I'm content in what God is doing. Do you understand with the children of Israel? And we touched on this. They murmured. We may see this mentioned as well in this book. There was a murmuring. There was a complaining. A dissatisfaction with what God was doing in their life and how God was doing it. Paul said, I have come to this. I've learned this. That whatever state I'm in, God's way, the best way. God's supply, exactly what I need. And I can take that. Hey, everything above that becomes a blessing. Do you eat cake for the cake or for the icing? I love icing. I'll eat the cake because that's the only way my mother would let me have the icing unless she wasn't looking. I even saw at Costco recently they sell icing by the bucket. I thought to myself, <laughs> office doesn't need to be refrigerated. Some of you are going, oh, hey, for me, life is the cake. That's the need. But the icing, that's God going above and beyond that, right? 
when you learn to appreciate the need that God fills in your life and everything else is icing, it's all so good. Not only that he would save me, that he would clothe me, that he would give me a place to live, but then he would give me friends and he would give me fellowship and he would give me opportunity. And that today you would be living in a country where you experience such freedom and such opportunity. Wow! How could we be discontented? Why shouldn't we have contentment? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this time in your word. Lord, may this truth settle in our hearts and our minds and may it help us, Lord, as you develop us, Lord, as we're learning through, also through life experience and through your word and through a consideration of who you are. Lord, we're rejoicing today in who you are and what you've done. And Lord, that's a plenty. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Who's here this morning? You'd say, preacher, I don't know for sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. I do not know that I'm saved, that I have peace with God. And you'd say, preacher, please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? I see a hand. Who else would say that this morning? Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. I'd like to know that. I'd be willing to let somebody show me from God's Word how I could know Christ as my Savior. Preacher, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Who else would say that today? If you're here this morning, you'd say, Preacher, God bless you. Preacher, I'm saved, but uh, you know what? I kind of live in that place of want, and I find myself at times dissatisfied with life and even dissatisfied relationships because I, I, I struggle in making it about me. Boy, I think if we're all fair and honest, when you have a good and honest assessment, it's easy to make it about self, isn't it? Well, may we today recognize that the Lord is all we need, and may we find in Him that satisfaction that the needs are filled. Who would say, Preacher, there was something in that for me today. Please pray for me, Preacher, as the Lord ministers to my heart. Would you raise your hand? Many hands this morning. God bless you. Well, I, I believe that all preaching is of a priority and importance, but I think this is a truth that just is one of these anchoring truths in our life that helps us to chart our course in a right way, regardless of what our calling in life is, to find our contentment in Christ, to not be governed, to not be frustrated and are motivated by want. Here in just a moment, we'll have a time of invitation. We have some folks that are coming this morning to follow the Lord and believers baptism. If you've been saved and not yet scripturally baptized, we encourage you to do the same as well. If you're here this morning, you'd like for somebody to take the time to show you how you could be saved, how to know from God's word how to be saved. There are men and there are ladies that would be glad to help you with that. And if you would simply like to come today and pray, and maybe it's time to come and bring your life and bring some areas of your life to the Lord and yield them to Him. However the Lord leads you, I trust that you'll respond to Him. Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed. I'm asking.